I see hearts and faces showing up, so that's good. It looks like we're starting to fill in the class. Cindy and Ann, how are you? Good morning to you. Pastor Rob just informed me that I'm on. I'm live, so I guess I have to watch what I say. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. We're going to get going here in just a moment as we fill in a little bit more. Now, now we're starting to fill up. I like to try to make sure everyone that wants to join is in before we get going. We'll give it another second, a minute or two here. <laughs> I see Joyce and Christy and uh, Laura, Jerome. Hello to all. Well, listen, let's get started. Uh, let's have a moment uh, just to open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, session, for this time together, Lord. We thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, even as your word is able to pierce through uh, thousands of years of uh, biblical history and church history, that, Lord, even now it's able to pierce through uh, this venue, Lord, of electronic uh, medium. And so, Lord, we just pray that... Uh, uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. We pray that there would be feeding and uh, awareness and healing, Lord, through the power of your words this morning. Thank you for the opportunity, and we bless you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be back with you again. And I don't see anyone here that doesn't know me, but in case you don't, my name is Mark Palladino. I have a history with uh, Lord of the Harvest as well as Pastor Oz. And um, <clears throat> he's invited me to come back for a second session. We're actually going to be doing a third session next week. So I'm going to be doing three sessions with you on Sunday morning. Um, kind of really come to enjoy this um, this venue. I know it's a little, it's, it's not like being in person, but uh, uh, just being sitting here in my, in my study. Uh, welcome to my little man cave. Uh, uh, just being able to talk to you, it's it's a, a little different than being in a pulpit and giving formal, formalized sermons where here I just feel like I'm talking to you. And so uh, this week I've been uh, pondering a lot about and had an opportunity to counsel with a young couple. Um, and, and in that discussion, we really got a good fresh look at the, the uh, conciliatory nature of God about understanding the nature of God's grace and kind of rebooting our lives in light of how great his grace is. And um, as I was pondering that, I just thought, I thought today we'd, we'd just kind of take a, a look at an old favorite story about Jesus and Peter in the gospel of John. But before we do that, I think what we'll do is kind of just uh, browse through that whole resurrection encounter and just see um, how John presents it to us, set some context, and then uh, just look at a couple of things. Um, so if you want to turn to John chapter 20 to get ourselves started here, and we're going to look at the first these post-resurrection encounters. And John selects a particular series of encounters in his, uh, in his approach uh, to the gospel that really illustrate to us uh, what the resurrection of Jesus means. Uh, it's, it's not just there to show the historical event, but John's whole gospel has this kind of prophetic nature to it where he takes images and ideas uh, in, from the Old Testament and brings them to light in Jesus, Jesus being the bread of life. And he speaks about the manna and the water of life as he goes and talks about rivers of living water from the book of Isaiah and on and on and on. He even goes so far as to capture Jesus' statement where he says, I am 
and uh, takes that right from the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 3, four, verse 14, where, uh, where the Lord introduced himself to Moses as I am. So this whole uh, resurrection account of John is, is saturated with uh, new creation imagery, an imagery that is drawn out of the Old Testament to show again how Jesus is the embodiment of these things and that the whole redemptive story uh, comes to focus on him and his life, his death, and his resurrection. And as we encounter John uh, chapter 20, the first uh, 10 verses or so, we, we see that we, we probably won't read all of this, but we'll just kind of comment on it. We see that uh, Mary Magdalene is the first to arrive at the, uh, at the tomb and uh, discovers that the stone's rolled away and it's empty. And, and she's, of course, ecstatic. And uh, she, she runs. And in verse 2, she comes and finds Peter and uh, John and says to them, they've taken away the Lord. And uh, they follow her and they go running to the tomb. And, uh, and stooping in, they look and they just simply see the, the linen wrappings. And uh, uh, they just go home. Um, uh, John, it says, of course, that John, uh, he, he looked and, and he, he, it says in verse, eight, in verse 8 that the disciple whom, the other disciple who had come to the tomb then also entered and believed. So there was an element of John actually coming to faith when he saw this and he remembered the scripture, which they had previously not understood that said that uh, he must rise again from the dead. So they all go to their homes, but Mary doesn't leave. And here's where it gets interesting. Um, and, and from 11 to 17, we have this encounter of Mary with Jesus. And some of these things you may have heard me teach on before, talk about before, but Mary is out there and, and this tomb is in a garden. We, we read in, in uh, John 19, 41, that the tomb is in a garden. And uh, she goes back and she looks inside and she sees something that she probably never could have imagined. She sees, uh, she sees the slab empty with no one on it, and she sees two angels sitting there on either side of it. Now, you got to appreciate this young Jewish lady who probably could have never imagined herself entering the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah, what the Jews called the manifest glory of God, sat in the, in the Holy of Holies in the, in the, uh, under the Old Covenant when the high priest would go in and offer the blood of the covenant. And here she is standing with a stone rolled away inside this cavern. And there it is, a slab with two angels sitting on it. And, and in her mind, I would just have to wonder what she was thinking at that moment, because it is a perfect reflection of what uh, we're, we're told of in, Je in Exodus chapter 25, where that great uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant is described as being all golden inside the holy room, the holiest of all. And there sat two cherubim, two angels uh, over it where the glory of God came. And, and later on, Paul in, in Romans 3 makes a remarkable statement. He says that Jesus is the propitiation, uh, that he has become a propitiation. The propitiation is the word uh, that was used by the Greek translators of the Old Testament, the word hilasterion, which is literally translated mercy seat in Greek in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is seen as the mercy seat, this whole scene of, of Christ himself being the, the place of mercy, the place where the glory of God actually would dwell. And, and all of that Old Testament imagery is just pointing to a glorious thing that would take place uh, and be fulfilled in Jesus. And if that isn't enough, she walks back out. And re as I said, she's in a garden. And, and here she's approached by Jesus. And she's thinking that he's the gardener. And they have this encounter. And, and uh, she, she doesn't realize it's Jesus. But the image here, again, John's bringing a phenomenal Old Testament picture here. He's, he's showing us a man and a woman in a garden, a new beginning with a, an Eden-like setting with a man and a woman in a garden. And so John is showing us that here Jesus is fulfilling not only the, the, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, but he's actually 
uh, reliving, rebooting the whole idea of the creation by showing John showing us this, this picture of a man and a woman standing in a garden as if to say that this is a, a, a brand new creation, a brand new start that is rooted in the, in the resurrection of Jesus, who John later refers to and who Paul later refers to him as the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead. And so this is a new beginning, a reboot. Well, as we move on in John 20, we see that Mary informs the disciples that she saw Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells her in verse 17 to go and tell them. And in verse 20, again, we have uh, Genesis imagery. In verse 22, I'm sorry, of John of John 20, where he says that... Um, that G Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we know in Genesis 2, in verse 7, Jesus did what to Adam? He says he breathed on, on Adam and he became a living soul. He breathed on him. So here is Jesus acting as very God, again, in a new creation, not only to live for himself, but as the very tree of life, as the very God of creation breathing on a new manhood, a new creation, a new uh, discipleship, a new Adamic creation a, or post-Adamic creation, these disciples who would be his apostles, that they would be the beginning of a brand new start, a, a brand new reboot of God's plan and purpose on the earth. And they would go forth and declare the gospel into all the world. Then moving on in John 20, in verse 20, uh, 60, uh, 26 through 31, uh, I won't go into this in detail, but this is now a week later, eight days later, it, it tells us. We have the, the doubting Thomas story. And here, Do you know, uh, Thomas is standing there in unbelief, and he just can't believe this happened. And Jesus said, look here, he doesn't criticize him for his unbelief. He just says here, touch my hands, touch my side. It's me. Blessed are those of you. Uh, blessed are you because you've seen, but blessed are those who uh, who have not seen yet believe. And then John kind of plays off on that as he, he, he breaks this little parenthetical note that we read in verse 30 that it says, therefore, many other signs that Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. So this whole issue of belief, believing is brought out in the story of Thomas and Jesus. And, uh, and John says, now I've written the stories that I've written so that you may believe. One more very uh, fascinating set of pictures that's shown now as we go to chapter 21, we encounter the disciples uh, 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 manifest, Jesus manifesting himself. And of course, Peter, uh, you know, Peter's with the, with the group and he says, I'm going to go fishing. And uh, as they're out fishing, they all, many of them join them. And as they're out fishing, guess who shows up on the shore? Jesus himself. And uh, again, I'm reminded now of, uh, that Jesus uh, tells them that you know, uh, they've caught nothing. They've been out there toiling, and Jesus tells them to, you know, throw the net on this side of the boat, and they get a great catch of fish. And here again is a picture from Ezekiel 47. In Ezekiel 47, the Lord said, I'll put fishermen out there, and they're going to gather fish of all kinds. And uh, th that great story about the, the river of God, as Ezekiel saw it trickling first from the sanctuary, and as this, and the season of redemption went on, it got deeper and deeper and deeper until it was a great river. The outflow of the Holy Spirit would be a river that could not be forded. And these men that Jesus chose would be fishermen, and they would go and they would catch fish. And, and in addition to that, he brings them ashore, and then he, he, what does he do? I mean, all the things that Jesus could have done now that he's resurrected, and he could have he could have talked to them about Jesus. He could have told them all about string theory or whether the earth is expanding or contracting, or maybe he could have told them about the details of Genesis one and, and how exactly he formed all the parts of the world and all the different things that mankind is concerned about. But what does Jesus do? He says, uh, bring some fish you've made in verse 10 that you've caught. And they, uh, uh, in verse 12, he says, let's have breakfast. 
And uh, if you want to turn to Exodus 24 for a minute, if you have your Bible, I think this is great. Exodus 24, you know, again, Jesus is looking at, uh, reflecting on something again in, in Exodus 24, starting at verse 9. Now Moses has gone up to the mountain. The Lord's begun to work with them, making the preparations for the tabernacle. And uh, he's going to order the tabernacle to be built, which is all seen in, in uh, Exodus 25 through the end of the book of Exodus. And um, it says that Moses went up and Lord commands that Mo Moses to bring up the elders of Israel. And he says to them, uh, Moses went up with Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, his, that is uh, Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And now these are the these are the new these are the those who will be the apostles of this new creation of God in the Old Testament of this new place of His habitation, and it says, and they saw the God of Israel, and under His feet there appeared a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet He did not stretch out His hand against the nobles, and the sons of, of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. So here God is calling this apostolic group of people, this this group of 70 elders to go forth. And, and the new creation imagery, by the way, is so uh, prevalent in, in the story of the Exodus from this point on, because from, from Exodus 7, uh, 25 to the end, God speaks to Moses seven times. Six times creative acts in preparing the tabernacle, just like he did on Genesis 1, six times he spoke and he created this and he created that. And then remarkably, on the seventh final time that he spoke to Moses, in the same way that he did in the, in the days of creation, he institutes the Sabbath. And, and in his way, he's saying, look, look Moses, I'm, we're creating a new habitation, a new, a new holy place, a new holy space for me to dwell among the children of Israel. So this whole new creation motif is so prevalent throughout Exodus. And John is extracting it again now out from its Old Testament place and bringing it to life in the person of Jesus. And then the gospel is cl close with Jesus' encounter with Peter and John. And uh, we won't go into that in detail, but before he does that, He's going to have a nose-to-nose -nose encounter with Peter. Very familiar story to most of you. And I think this is powerful because these great theological realities can never be left in some kind of theoretical realm of, shall we say, philosophical reflection. They always are going to come to bear on the human condition. And so this great grace that God demonstrates to us is going to come to bear on a reboot for Peter. Now, you all know the story of Peter at the Last Supper. John 13, you can look it up, verse 36 to 38. Who's going to deny you, Lord? Not me. could never be me. I would never deny you. The Lord says, ah, Peter, watch. You think you got it together. Peter denies vehemently. As a matter of fact, in Mark 14, 31, the word ek perisos is used in the Greek. And, and, and most uh, history tells us that Mark wrote his gospel under the guidance or tutelage of Peter. Probably Peter narrated it to him. So Peter's remembering his own uh, vehemence, his own words. And the word Mark uses this ekarisos means vehement and insistently denying, over the top denying that I could ever deny you, Lord. We used to sing it in the Jesus movement. Remember Pastor Oz and Jan? Though none go with me, still I will follow. 
<laughs> Maybe others won't, but I, not me. I will. I will follow. When we all know what happened to Peter, Peter's self-preservation kicked in at the time of Jesus's death. People spotted him three times. You were with him. You're one of his. No, no. He cursed and swore it wasn't me. Now he's face to face with Jesus. Jesus looks at him. In verse 15 of chapter 21, so when they finish breakfast, Jesus puts his attention on Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had told him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. If you don't mind, I'm going to characterize that for you a little bit. My picture of this is Peter having totally screwed everything up as badly as one can screw it up. I have to imagine that if I, if I look like I'm looking down, it's because I am. Because I think when Jesus first said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? I think Peter had a hard time looking Jesus in the eye. He had messed up so badly. He said, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus is trying to get through him. Peter, I got work for you to do. Peter, do you love me? Second time. Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, Peter, I got work for you to do. And a third time. And this time I think Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, look at me. Get your head in the game. Get your head out of, <clears throat> well, you know what? Don't you know that I knew what you were like when I called you? Don't you know how mis the miserable failure that I know you're capable of being? Don't you know that my grace is large enough to cover that? And it's important for you to understand my conciliatory nature that I want to forgive you that I want to give you a new start that I want you to lift your head get it out of the sand and lift your head and look at me and understand just who I am and what happened at that cross that you just saw not too long ago You see, church, in the, in the cross. And Peter, by the way, would look at this moment. And he would write about it in 1 Peter 1.3 when he would said, we were born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. For Peter, that resurrection, that encounter with Jesus was like his rebirth, his reboot. His response to this great grace that was being poured out and shown and evidenced through all the Old Testament pictures and symbols and ideas, it suddenly was now being brought to bear as he stood before God, before the very Yahweh God, invited to eat and drink, invited to let go of his sins, invited to look boldly at God, and begin to do the things that God wanted him to do because he lives in a lost and dying world. Well, there's another text that I've been mulling around and I wasn't sure if I was going to go into it today, but I want to look at it. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, another favorite text. 
since we have a little time yet. I hope that you are tracking with me because it's hard to hear amens. <laughs> In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul begins, I'm going to take it from verse, uh, let's say verse 14. For the love of Christ controls or constrains us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Boy, I've been rolling that around quite a bit in my brain right now, trying to get my arms around what Paul was saying, and I think he was saying that, as he told us in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is the last Adam that Jesus in that moment on the cross took the whole of the Adamic liability of the human race and took it to the cross with himself as the last Adam. It's because as he goes on, he says, and he, as one died, therefore all died, and he died for all that they who live might no longer live to themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Those who live, Jesus said in John 5, the hour is coming and now is that they, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who live, those who hear shall live. What a privilege you and I have as having been dead and though we didn't realize it when it happened, we actually heard the voice of the Son of God to bring us out of life, out of death into life. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him any, uh, this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone uh, is in Christ, he is a new creature. It is a new creation. Old things passed away, and all things have become new. All these things are from God who reconciled himself to us, himself, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ Reconciling the, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you catch that? It isn't merely that Christ stood as the mediator, which we know he did, but we don't see in Paul's picture here an angry God we see the image of a conciliatory God who is actively involved in an act of restorative justice for mankind. To taking the initiative, he is the offended one, taking the initiative to reconcile the offender to himself. What a powerful image of God's grace, of God's nature. But not only that, that he has committed to us the ministry, the deaconship, literally it says in the, great, in the, in the Greek, a deaconship, a service of reconciliation. Let's drop the, and abandon the arrogant, moralistic Christianity. The, the arrogance of the Peter who thinks, I'm stronger than them. I'm somehow moral, moral, uh, morally superior to them. And understand that we are pathetic human beings in desperate need of the grace of God 
who have now received the grace of God and have been go and, and called to go out in a spirit of reconciliation to reconcile dying people to the cross of Jesus. He says, we are therefore ambassadors. We who inhabit God's kingdom are now representative wherever, whatever country we're in, whatever environment we're in, we are as ambassadors in a foreign country. We are representatives of, catch this, goodwill, not condemnation. Not judgment, not holier than thou. And this whole thing is what cost Israel their inheritance. We are ambassadors. Now in the ancient world, especially in Rome, which is Paul's environment, there were two types of provinces. There were senatorial provinces, which were basically voluntarily under the rule of Rome. Ambassadorships probably were quite pleasant. I'm sure they had time to have an occasional meal and dinner with different people because there was a essentially a cooperative connection between these vassal states and Rome. But there are also imperial provinces. And those provinces were, well, let's say they were resistant. And so these ambassadors had a little bit more to work on. But you see, it's very much like our world today. As a matter of fact, if you want to, I'm going to go here. Put your finger, keep your finger in, in, in we're having Bible study here. All right, so let's study the Bible. Sec, uh, we're, going to, we're going to keep your finger in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, and we're going to look at Matthew 13. We're going to go back to Matthew 13 again, simple parable. One you're all aware of. Thirteen, thirty-one, thirty-two. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in a field, and this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Jesus is describing the kingdom of heaven. He's describing what it's going to be like. Well, it's interesting. Do you know where he took that image from? The birds of the... It's from Daniel chapter 4. You probably have that referenced in your reference Bible. The exact words that Daniel used to describe Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom a great tree, and under that tree, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field found refuge. The nations, the beasts of the field, and their, <laughs> and those powers and principalities that are behind them, if they honor the church, if they honor Christ, then, 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 then the kingdom is a refuge for them. And so this reconciliation of God is not only, it has two threads. It, it, it saves us in the salvific sense, sense but it also speaks of the, the message of international relations, the kingdom of God in the middle of the kingdoms of the world. And we are ambassadors we render service to the world in blessing. Bless those who curse you. Do good to spite those who spitefully use you. These are, this is the work of ambassadors bringing, bringing the goodness of God, the conciliatory nature of God to the world. And back in 2 Corinthians 5, this is how Paul completes his thought. 
as we are, in verse 20, ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You should put that in quotes, because what Paul is saying is, it's as if Christ is saying through the church to the world, we beg you, God isn't mad at you, be reconciled to him, because in the cross, he put to death the whole Adamic liability against you. It all boils down to two simple propositions. Belief, unbelief. And Jesus said, this is the condemnation. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. But let men love darkness rather than light. He made him to be, who knew no sin, to be sin or a sin offering on our behalf that we might become the justice of God in him. Not the righteousness, the justice, the context here. Paul is making a distinction between the justice of God and the justice, the conciliatory justice in God's kingdom, the the uh, restorative justice in God's kingdom that causes the offended to reach out in a conciliatory way to the one who has offended against the Roman concept of justice, which is you get what's fair. Justitia, they called it, justice in Latin, justitia. Justitia, possibly. And he's saying, we now are a conciliatory justice. We are a demonstration that God was in Christ, not standing back saying, go to the cross or I'll destroy the whole thing but that very God himself was in Christ as the offended one reaching out to reconcile his creation in the person of his beloved son. That the power of death cannot hold, the power of sin cannot hold down those who believe. I'm going to wrap it up here. It's been nice talking to you. I hope, my fervent hope, that these ramblings uh, kind of could gel together and make some sense to you. Um, this being my study, <laughs> I'm it was kind of an opportunity just to toss out some ideas and things. And I know it was kind of a mixed bag, but somehow it all comes together. It comes back to Jesus. Great theological notions coming back to encountering a human being who is a miserable failure. And this conciliatory God in the person of Jesus coming to him and saying, abandon your arrogant, moralistic Christianity, Peter ain't going to fly. You don't have the stripes to walk like that. You never will. And for us, the resurrection means just as death could not hold Jesus in his power, so our sins, our failures, our weaknesses, which operate under the reign of that death, will never cause us to have to hold our heads down, that we can look at Jesus, get forgiveness, be awakened again to our sense of purpose and our calling, to be ambassadors for Christ, to be ministers of reconciliation, to give others what God has given us. And boy, has he given us something. Has he given us something. What a hope we have in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. 
We thank you for your unspeakable grace and power that works toward us believe, to believe. Lord, we may always and ever humble ourselves before you and before man and offer your gracious gift in a spirit of humility and love and grace as we embrace your tremendous, tremendous love and conciliatory nature, your restorative justice that you have expressed toward us. Even though you are the offended, you take the steps to heal the rift and bridge the gap. May we be the same, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for uh, Pastor Jan, Pastor Oz, as they bring forth your word in the next session. I pray your the richness of your blessing will be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You have a blessed day. It's been my pleasure to speak with you and look forward to hearing you again, talking with you again next week. God bless.